defining the, each of the different subjects that will be helpful in, again in your personal and professional careers. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Negrini, who will be speaking on the application of Benford's Law to detect fraud. Uh, Dr. Negrini is truly a pioneer in the application of digital frequencies to detect fraud. Dr. Negrini has focused on the use of Benford's Law in, in fraud detection and has developed methodologies for the law's application. He has written articles for several professional journals, including the balance sheet and the white paper. Dr. Negrini is an assistant professor for the, for the Department of Accounting at St. Mary's University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And Dr. Negrini was also assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, he, Dr. Negrini has presented his application at several seminars in the United States and abroad and has developed a spreadsheet template that automatically performs several major digital analysis tests. Uh, without, for, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Negrini. Thank you very much. flying from Nova Scotia to New York City, absolutely cancelled. And so just to give you a clue, they rocked that through Montreal, and the temperature in Montreal was minus 13 when I arrived. And I won't convert it to Fahrenheit, trust me, that's enough to keep your people in very cold. That's a real problem with warm up at that point. So it's nice to be here, thank you very much. And the focus of my talk today will be the fact that when, when people invent numbers, those numbers are invented with some purpose in mind. Those numbers exhibit patterns that make them discernible from true numbers. And it sounds like magic, but there'll be enough examples to show you. <coughs> I'll tell the example here. Well, we'll start off with a few, few premises. For example, people, firstly, are not random. You're not random as a country, and you're not random as individuals. I would almost guess that if I watched you this morning, your every move before you left to work, and I watched you the two other mornings, that would be the exact routine that you followed for the previous five years, and it's going to be the exact routine you're going to follow for the next five years. So, if you buy that, we're on our way. People are not random. Second thing is, we concern you with mainly auditing, and uh, if you are an auditor, you have a few basic questions to ask. One of them is what to audit and how much to audit. And so the techniques that we'll be talking about this morning will give you a first pass at seeing whether a set of data appears somewhat in need of auditing. To start with the mathematics, please slow me down if I do go a little too fast. Uh, otherwise I won't slow down. It's taking a while to get warmed up here. Whenever I, I teach a class and it's an 8.30 class, I always tell them that. 8.30 in the morning, real people with real jobs are really working. And they sit there terribly tired. Uh, you know what to say? Don't bug me. And I tell, I always use the example of New York City. I say they really are working. So please do ask questions and I'll warm up as well now that it is approaching 11 o'clock. The mathematics goes way back to the year 1881. That was the first study. The second study was done in 1938. I think we have the oldest bit of citation here. I will be able to speak here from the Secret Service later on this afternoon. The Secret Service might have existed before 1881, and he can correct me on that, but maybe that's a secret. So <laughs> <laughs> we might never know. Way back in 1938, a physicist, Frank Benford, uh, PhD, worked <coughs> at General Electric Research Laboratory, did a fantastic study. It took 20 lists of numbers that covered wide, wide things, the street addresses, the lengths of rivers, chemical compounds, just these 20 lists of numbers. They totaled 20,229 observations. And he tabulated how many times the digit one appeared as a first digit in all these numbers. How many times the digit two appeared as a first digit? How many times the digit three appeared? And this study, I do know, it took many years for him to complete. I think he would feel very, very disappointed if I could tell him that with modern computer science, 
you could take a list of 20,000 numbers now, and I could replicate his entire test in about eight seconds <laughs> of CPU time, start to finish, reading the data set to printing the output. But he did that, and he found that the number one was the most frequently occurring first digit, followed by the number two, all the way down to the number nine. But then he used some mathematics and physics-based assumptions, and he came up with the pure mathematical formulas for how many times we should expect to see a one, a two, a three, and a four, and so forth in tabulated data. And just for the record, this is 1995, so in the year 1995, the one is the first digit, nine is the second, nine is the third, and five is the fourth digit. And so then the law says, and if we have tabulated data, it should look something close to this. <coughs> On the left, we have the first position. And the number zero cannot be a first position. We always have to start with a one through to a nine. And you can see from the table that the digit one has appeared, is expected to appear, 30.1% of the time in tabulated data. Digit number two, 17.6% of the time. Nine is our least favorite uh, digit, 4.6% of the time. If we go to the second position, the zero is expected to appear about 12% of the time, all the way down to the digit nine, which is expected only 8.5% of the time. 